Good morning. Good morning. All right. Everybody else is out in the lobby sniffing all the taco smell out of the, uh, out of the building for our big taco lunch that we're having uh, following our worship gathering. So for the folks in, in the lobby right now, it's following the gathering that you can eat the tacos. Leave the tacos alone right now. All right. Just, just sometimes you have to take care of business. That's all I'm saying. We well, have to have a couple of announcements we want to share with you before uh, we begin uh, our time in song and prayer. Uh, and even continue today. Uh, the first is whether you're with us in the room or whether you're online, maybe for the very first time, shoot us a quick text. Will you let us know that you're here? Say hello. Uh, maybe you're old school and you just want to do it in person. Uh, you can just stop out and see Jennifer and I. We'll be at the Welcome Center uh, following our gathering today. We'd love to connect with you that way as well. But by you doing this digital connect card, that just lets you say hello to us, us say it back, and then see how we might be able to come alongside you uh, as you journey down this road uh, with Jesus Christ. That we are not going to hound you, we just want to connect uh, and see how we might be able to begin a new relationship with you. Uh, also, we've got the tacos today. I think I talked about that, uh, but we can't talk about tacos enough. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. All right. You know, it's, uh, it was weird on social media. We were going to celebrate Jesus and tacos, but we didn't want to make like tacos look right up there with Jesus. I mean, they're good, but Jesus is still Jesus, right? But we are going to have our big taco lunch following uh, our time together today over in our fellowship hall space, and you are welcome to join us and be a part of that. Also, students 6 to 12th grade tonight, 4 o'clock, youth ministry is happening. If, again, if you're watching online, if you're here in town, know that there's a place for your young people here tonight at 4 o'clock. Um, it's a great chance to meet some new friends, uh, have a blast, and then learn more about Jesus uh, in a way that makes sense, a way that's comfortable, a way that's inviting to students. 6th to 12th grade, so you are welcome to join us for that. Also, we want to let you know, on Sunday, June 2nd, we're going to be having a special call, uh, I hate to use the word business meeting because it sounds so terrible, but we're having a special business meeting, all right? Uh, this will be a very quick uh, special business meeting that we're calling. It's just simply uh, that we need to add a new person to our nominating committee and we have that person's name. We just need you as the body, those who call this place home. We need you to say yay or nay to that uh, person's uh, that's, that's being submitted for that position. Uh, it should take just literally just a few minutes to knock that out. Uh, so that's coming up Sunday, June 2nd, uh, following our worship there. Is that the last one? No, it is not. All church workday coming up. We're going to be doing some cleaning. Uh, there's a garage or a shed, however you look at that building that's out further to the south of, of our property. Uh, somebody should be proud of me because I just remember that that was south. That <laughs> in a directional turn. Yes. And I'm pointing for that direction. Good day, church. We are going to be doing some cleaning out of that space, uh, but we're also going to be doing some indoor work too because not everybody wants to play around with the lawn tractors and, and all the dirt. We'll be working in the kitchen uh, and our pantry area as well, doing some more cleaning and organizing and thinning out uh, cabinets and things of that nature. Uh, so come on Saturday, June the 8th from 9 to 12. Work day, we'll find something for everybody to do. We'll hang out together. We'll have a great time. And because we love you, there will be donuts. Amen. Amen. So now that we're talking about tacos and donuts, which, by the way, could go together nicely. I'm just saying. Uh, let's, let's, let's talk about Jesus, right? The thing that really satisfies. The, really, the thing that, that, that really does. We know the scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good and he is good. Amen? Amen. 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 And hold on to that. Is that okay? Yes. Go ahead and stand up and we'll be here. And I just want to say happy birthday, church. Today, today is the day that we celebrate the day of Pentecost, the day that the Holy Spirit, the gift that Jesus promised us, came to the church. And that's really the day that the church started. And that's what we're celebrating today. Jesus had told his disciples that he was going to go away and he was going to send a helper to them, a counselor, the Spirit. And he says this in the, in the 14th chapter of John. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. 
and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to come into our worship service today. Let's sing together, shall we? Tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. 
And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. There's nothing that with the Spirit we can't do that He can't do through us.
accept the Lord Jesus as our Savior, and He indwells us with His living Spirit. And through Him, He transforms us day by day. And so let's invite Him in today. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and fill this place and fill us. Let us be used for your purposes. That's all.
Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that as you promised us, you did not leave us as orphans in this world. And even though the world can't see you anymore physically, your presence invades every portion of this world in this universe. There is nowhere that we can go with your spirit. There is nowhere that is beyond your power and beyond your grasp. We cannot flee from you. We cannot hide from you. The darkness is this light to you. What an amazing gift. What an amazing thing to remember. Help our souls and our hearts and minds to bring that to mind whenever we feel alone. Whenever we feel that darkness is closing in on us. Whenever life seems too hard. Holy Spirit, God, speak to our hearts. Lord Jesus, fill us with your presence in you. Help us to know that together you will get us through no matter what it is. You have promised us your presence. What a comfort. What an amazing gift. We are so thankful for that. And Lord Jesus, you've told us in your word that apart from you, we can do nothing. And it is through your spirit indwelling and filling our lives, our souls, our mind, and body, that we are able to live this life with you, victorious, as we walk through the journey together. And Lord, it is through you, you and your word and your spirit that we are able to share the good news of the gospel with those around us that so desperately need to also have the presence of the living God renewing and redeeming and forgiving and restoring. What an amazing gift. We are so thankful today that 2,000 years ago that spirit came and fell on those people in that place. And Lord, Peter went out and preached a sermon and 3,000 members were added to your church that very day. And Lord, that is the same spirit that we serve today. That is the same spirit that is available to each and every believer that calls on your name. There is nothing Stop. There's nothing that's been diminished. You are still the same as you were there, and there's nothing that you can't do. And Lord Jesus, we pray that you would come with your spirit today and that you would fall on us. Renew us, revive us in a powerful way. Melt us and mold us, Lord Jesus, into what you would have us to be. We are here. Come, that's our prayer. Amen. Even if you hear it, you know, as a response to our
that song in this room without things breaking. Um, and I found where that line is. I didn't cross it, but I sure did dance on it. And it was a lot of fun. So man, we, we may have just pushed a little hard earlier in the week, and, and the sound system said, Ooh, Uncle, we did that once already. I don't know if we can do it twice, but that's all right. That's all right. Are you ready to dive into this today? Yes. Good. I, I know I am. I'm thankful to be here. I'm glad you are here. And uh, again, I, if you are with us uh, on, a, on a routine basis, I hope this Psalm 23 series has been meaningful to you. I hope that you have uh, not just learned something, but that the Holy Spirit of God has been speaking to you and transforming you as he speaks through his word. If you are joining us somewhere online, whether Facebook Live or whether you're checking us out later on YouTube, you can find all of these messages online if you'd like to go back and listen to any of them at all. You can find those there if you're on YouTube. Uh, you can find us at Fellowship Lincoln. And the uh, playlist is right there, and you shall be good to go. Well, I know we were standing a lot today, so I'm going to be nice, and I'm going to have you sit, but I am going to have you read with me again. Psalm 23. Some of you are going, he's making us do that again? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. And uh, for some of you, this may be the first time you're here in the room with us, um, and that's okay. Uh, you can just read along if you'd like. The words will be on the screen behind me because this is Psalm 23. It's only six verses long. And so can we, uh, can we just read this together out loud once again? Start by saying, The Lord is my, my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for he are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Ever. Amen. 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 It, uh, it just never stops, does it? It never gets old. It is, it's, it's almost as if every time in these few weeks that we've been walking through this text, as we read it out loud together, that something different seems to leap off the page, right? And so it's as if the Holy Spirit himself is highlighting just a different part. And maybe for each one of us who are gathered in this room, it's a different part for everybody. Because the Lord is speaking to us because he knows us intimately and knows exactly what we need. Well, today uh, we are going to continue in verse 4, but the tail end of verse 4. The section that says, for you are with me. For you are with me. Now, I know last week, if you were here with us, when we talked about the cup of trust, right? We were really focused on this trusting relationship uh, that the King David, the writer of this psalm, had and has with the Lord his God. And then how that trust is what was able to compel him to continue moving forward in spite of all the dark circumstances of life. He knew that he was never alone, and so we hinted at that, and I want to address it maybe a little bit more in depth today, this idea of God being with us. God being with us. And so we're focusing on that phrase, for you are with me. Would you bow your head as we ask the Lord to speak today? Our Lord and our God, we are gathering this place. We are watching somewhere online. And we want desperately to hear from you. Lord, they don't need to hear a preacher's voice. They need to hear yours. Lord, I know that my words fall short. I know that my words can fail, but your word never does. And so Lord, on this Pentecost Sunday, when we celebrate and are reminded of the precious gift of your Holy Spirit, 
just given to the super-Christians, to those who are more holy than all the rest, Lord Jesus, all who call you Lord and Savior, who have surrendered their lives to you, receive the gift of your Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit has power. Power to speak to our hearts and our minds. Power to change our hearts and our minds. Power to, to touch us in the depths of our very souls and do a brand new and exciting work. And so, Lord, we pray that your word would go forth today with the strength and the power of your Holy Spirit. Well, this, this thing I want to talk about today is, is a killer. It really is a killer. In fact, scientists and researchers and, and, and even, even magazines uh, like AARP, yeah, they're starting to show up at my house. What are they doing? <laughs> anyway, it, it's sad. And I don't want to get used to it. I can't. I shall not. Uh, right, right, right. Will not, I will not go into the dark night, right? But this, this killer is in so many people's lives. And this killer, well, the studies show that this killer will lead to heart disease. This killer can, can, can actually make someone more vulnerable to things like Alzheimer's. This killer can cause high blood pressure. This killer can even bring on things as dramatic and drastic as suicide to the very common cold. This killer in our lives is, is more dangerous to our health than obesity. And in fact, some researchers say this killer if it exists in our lives, is actually the equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. This killer, well, causes inflammation in our brains, and then it causes all of our other negative feelings to then begin to multiply and be magnified. And then ultimately this killer continues to cause us to isolate ourselves from other people. What is this killer? It's loneliness. Loneliness. The killer that is loneliness. Church, I want us to know today that God's design from the very beginning was not for you and I to experience and live in loneliness. From the very beginning, God had designed for us to be in communion with Him. That we would never be alone, that he would be right there with us. That was the design in the garden from the very beginning, long before sin ever actually entered into the picture. God's design was for his creation, us, to be in communion with him. When he formed a man out of the dirt, he said, this actually is not good because it's not good for man to be alone. That man would potentially become lonely. And so woman was formed. And God said, this is really good. This is really good. God walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. He was there. They conversed. I'm sure they laughed. I don't know, did they eat meals together? I don't know, but they were together. Communion with God. Fighting the killer that is loneliness. 
When we look all throughout the scriptures, we see people like Abraham, and we see people like Moses or, or Joshua, and, and, and these great pillars of the faith were, were men and women who, who were able to keep their eyes on the promise that God was never going to leave them. He was never going to forsake them. That he would be right there. Enter Jesus into the scene. You know, at Christmas time, we refer to a name for Jesus, Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so Jesus, God in the flesh, came to this earth to be with you and me. And Jesus, he, he, he picked his disciples and, and, and he was with them. He walked with them, he journeyed with them, he ate with them, he slept with them, he fished with them, he went through storms with them, he went through trials and difficulties with them. The crowds continued to grow over the years of Jesus' ministry, and more and more people began to be with Jesus. But Jesus came knowing that the cross was the final step in his journey on this earth. And so Jesus said, I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to bleed and I am going to die for the forgiveness of sin, for all of mankind. And, and, and when that is finished, they're going to put me in a tomb, but I'm going to raise again on the third day because I'm still going to be with and before he ascended back to the Father, he, he told all of his disciples, he said, listen, there's a day coming, don't you worry. I know you're scared because you're hearing me talk about leaving you, but Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you like an orphan. Oh no, I'm going to send you a gift. And it's actually good for you that I go away because this gift is my Holy Spirit who will live in you 24-7. You have access to be with me all the time. Jesus had no desire for us to battle loneliness. This is part of being in a fallen world and, and having broken lives and, and having sin and all these other things that were never part God's perfect design. Loneliness comes through all of that. So if all of this is true, though, that God's not going to leave us and forsake us, and, and we celebrate this Pentecost day of the gift of the Holy Spirit, where we have the Lord our God all the time, then why? Why in the world do we face loneliness? Why do we at times battle it? Sometimes it just rears its ugly head. We didn't even, we weren't expecting it. We didn't necessarily notice any change. It just shows up. And all of a sudden we find ourselves dealing with loneliness. And loneliness truly is an epidemic in our culture today. When, when we experience the pandemic that was COVID, Oh, did we come to that understanding quickly. And it wasn't just us extroverts at home, right, who had no people to talk to, or, or like you, just the same two or three people, right? Like, I love you, but I need some more, right? Nobody else said that out loud in their house, it was just me? Okay. But it was so much more than that. We began to understand in the course of those weeks and then months of this pandemic, how lonely we could get and how quickly. And we all began to long for, for something greater. We, we knew there was something inside of us that there wasn't right, it wasn't meshing up, it wasn't gelling. We, we, were, we were having negative thoughts and negative feelings and, and trying, to, trying to entertain it and satisfy with all kinds of things, whatever it could be. We had to order it on Amazon because the store didn't have it, but we sure did order it, didn't we? We were lonely and trying to not be. But in 
this epidemic with our culture, people are more connected now than they ever have been before. And yet loneliness continues to raise in its depth and in its number. Social media is a great tool to be able to catch up with people and see pictures that you may not have otherwise seen of friends and family and, and celebrations and all of this kind of stuff. But, but, but as much as I am a social media guy, it's not the same as a real connection with a real person. Now, do not hear what I'm not saying. I am, do not let me go, well, here goes another boomer talking about, you know, social media in a negative way. First of all, I'm Gen X, so okay. all right? <laughs> but that's not what we're saying. We're saying we recognize social media has some very good things about it, but it's not the true depth meaning and experience that comes when we are connected with others. And so this epidemic just continues to skyrocket. People who, who are, are just suffering from loneliness. Now here's what we have to understand about loneliness. You can live alone and not experience loneliness. I know a lot of people who, who live alone and, and, and are some of the most connected People, they don't really struggle with that. And there are people who can be in a crowded room and feel completely alone. Amen. So, so we have to understand that there's a difference between being alone and feeling lonely. All right? And I want to submit to us today that this idea of loneliness really comes down to being an issue in the heart. In the heart. Uh, and it's about the presence of others. So here's two things I want to share, two quick quotes. The first one is from a gentleman by the name of Les Carter. In his writing, Mind Over Emotions, he says, Loneliness is a feeling of separation, isolation, or distance in human relations. Loneliness implies emotional pain, an empty feeling, and a yearning to feel understood and accepted by someone. Love, love that definition and the way he paints the picture of what loneliness really looks like. And this is why we want to talk about this so much today. And this is why we must, before we go home today, understand that the importance of saying, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing because you are with me. You are with me. And when you are with me, Lord Jesus, get through this, right? The second one I'm going to share with you is from Tim Hansel. His writing is through the wilderness of loneliness. He said, loneliness is not the same as being alone. Loneliness is feeling alone, no matter how many people are around you. It's a feeling of being disconnected, unplugged, left out, and isolated, right? Get this, church. That's not God's design for and I want you to hear the good news today, that no matter where you find yourself in life right now, whether, you've been, whether you're sitting in our seats today, suffering in silence through loneliness, or whether you've been through it before, or maybe it'll just come into your life at some point down the road, you need to know this. The Lord your God, Jesus Christ, the one who bled and died for your salvation, is the same one who gives his Holy Spirit to all believers in order that they are not disconnected from the most important one. That they can understand while the rest of the world might fail me, while the rest of people may not even make attempts at reaching out to me or talking to me or, or, or whatever it might be, I have the king of all kings on speed dial. And I can speak to him whenever I want. And, and the more I grow in my relationship with him, the closer I feel to him. And that ends up being enough. Don't misunderstand me. It's still sad when we have other people in our lives who just really don't want to be in our lives. I get that. But listen to me, church. 
Jesus Christ is enough. I promise you that. If you have Jesus, then you have every single thing that you need. And he doesn't desire for you to be lonely. He desires to take you by the hand and walk through every step of the way. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing because he is there with me. All right, so let's talk about loneliness then. Because loneliness, then, this implies it requires some evaluation, right? If I'm struggling with loneliness, i got to eventually ask myself why. What might be going on deep inside of me that's bringing about this loneliness? Now, I, I was telling Jennifer about this last night. I hope this communicates well. Um, I want this to be heard the right way. What you're going to see on the screen, we have four things to evaluate when we wrestle with this thing called loneliness. These are not to be heard as condemnation. These are not to be heard as criticism. These are not to be heard in a negative way, in any way, shape, or form, that makes you go, well, great, I'm glad I went to church, they make you feel so much better. Right? It's, it, it's not that. At the same time, we have to be honest and go, wait a minute. There might be some things in my life that the Lord wants to redeem, that the Lord wants to remove, because it's why I'm ultimately experiencing this loneliness. All right? So here's the first one. Loneliness requires evaluation of our relationships. Loneliness requires evaluation of our relationships. Okay? So King David understood this uh, because he had a ton of relationships. He was the king. So he was surrounded by people. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? The answer is yes. Right? Because it all depends on who the people are. It all depends on the circumstances and, and the situation. Because some people are there to encourage you. Some people are there to take you out. Right? Some people are trying to play both sides of the fence. All right? So you have to take the time to evaluate these relationships. And, and, and King David knew what loneliness was like because he was being chased by people. People who were out after him. People who had been sent by King Saul, the king who was really ticked off at David. That relationship was not a good one, right? And so as, as all of that began to play out, David finds himself alone in caves, running and hiding because of the relationships that were in his life. And we all have to take this pause and go, huh, could it be that there are some relationships in my life that may actually be contributing to my loneliness, my feeling lonely in life, right? So it is that whole idea of sometimes we have to go, maybe this relationship is toxic. That's a hard conversation to have with yourself, right? Because we're always told to be nice and, uh, and you know, not to think and bad things about anybody, but let me just set you free today. There are some people in your mind that are toxic, and it's okay to turn and go in the other direction because they are not helping you, right? They are not good for you. It doesn't necessarily mean they're terrible people, but where they are right now is a place where they need to get themselves healthy, they need to get their life in gear, and you have been trying to love and encourage and support and be their help and, and, and ultimately be their everything, and it's not working in this time of Somebody needs to be set free from that today. These toxic relationships will contribute to your loneliness because you are the one that is always doing the giving. <laughs> Ever been there? You're the one that's doing all the giving. You're the one that's doing all the phone calls. You're the one that's doing all the sacrifice. You're the one that's doing it all. And it's not being reciprocated back because it's a toxic, unhealthy relationship. 
and yet you're going, man, this person's my friend. They've been my friend for, for now 30 years. Well, okay, that's 30 years of, ugh. Are you tired of it yet? Because you're lonely, even though you're calling this person your friend. So maybe, just maybe, that relationship needs some evaluation after all. Right? David was in this situation. He, he, he longed for people to be his support and his encouragement when all the negative voices were saying differently. If you read through the Psalms, you realize very quickly David had no problem expressing how he really felt about stuff. And when David had those moments where he was feeling truly alone, he said so. The kicker is, and this is what we got to understand, David would always land in a place where he said, but my God, my God will be with me. My God will deliver me. My God will be my strength. My God will be my shield. My God will be my encouragement. No matter what is happening in these toxic relationships all around me, he knew that Jesus Christ was enough. Right? So we have to ask ourselves, do we have real relationships? I mean like real ones. I don't mean Facebook friends. Right? Not that, like that's, that's all well and good. Uh, but I, I look through my list of my Facebook friends, and I'm, I'm thankful for them all. But I think the last time I talked to some of those people uh, was like when we graduated high school in, in 1996. Right? Found them on Facebook, they found me, and we, oh, that's nice. That's so and so from school. And you click the button, and you're your friends, but are you really? Right? I think Joe couldn't tell you their kids' name. I couldn't tell you if they're married. I don't even know what half of them live. Right? I mean, it's just that's the way it works. But we, we get so caught up in our culture today where we call those people, those are my friends. They are maybe an acquaintance, but they're not necessarily a friend. Okay? And so these relationships that we have, do we really have them? Or are we working toward real relationships? I don't mean just knowing somebody's name when you pass through the same place every week, right? I mean a real relationship, the hard work of it, the hard work that takes time to really develop. Do we have those relationships or are we in a position where we are chasing after something else? Is something else more important than the relationships? That American dream, if you will, right? Where we're working really hard because we're trying to get the promotion. Or we, where we're working really hard because, because we, we want to be able to, to purchase this boat or to get this house or to, to put this much money away in retirement or what, whatever it might be. And so we're pursuing all these other things and we're feeling lonely because we have not yet made time for real we have to evaluate the relationships we have or that we don't have. Why might that be the case? You know, we live in a society where people are increasingly isolated. I, I, I've shared this before. If you ever come visit my little neighborhood, my little apartment complex, then there are plenty of apartment buildings there. I don't see many of them. Because our whole place is designed and you come home from the grocery store, you hit the garage door button, and then you go inside and you park the car inside the garage and you carry the groceries right into the house. And I don't have to look at anyone. And they're all everybody's doing the same thing. So seeing someone outside, it's like a Christmas miracle. It really <laughs> truly is. We get excited. And then we wonder what their names might be. Right? We we name all kinds of people. Right? But, but it's, people are isolated. We just kind of keep to ourselves so much so. Are we really reaching out to people if we're experiencing this loneliness? Right? Are we really putting in the effort to reach out as well? Now, don't misunderstand. There's a lot of things in our lives that can be in the way, that can make this a challenge. Whether it be, you know, being like, man, I'm really, really shy, and that's hard for me. I, I get it. I, I get it, right? But you can, we're not saying introduce yourself to a crowd of different people. Find your one. Find your one. And, 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 and ask the Lord to give you the 
remember, Jesus with you. It's you and Jesus going to meet someone. Right? But do that. I know there's times when people are struggling with things like depression or, or anxiety that, that it really is challenging. And that's one of the, the uh, difficult things about stuff like depression. It's this, this never-ending negative loop. Right? And we, we go, oh man, I'm, I'm really lonely. I should get connected with some people. But I can't get connected with any people. Just can't do it. Just can't do it. I understand all that. We're not dismissing any of those things. At the same time, we are saying, are we putting in the effort to build relationships and actually us trying to connect with other people? Or are we just kind of hoping by osmosis or a spaceship or whatever that they can drop into our front yard and, and, and that we all of a sudden become friends? Listen to me. I, I, I get it. At the age of 46 now, I get it. You know, making friends is an adult. And it's hard. It's really cool when you're kids. Go with my friend. Poor sucker that happened to live in the house next door to me. Right? You live on my street, we are friends. You have a right to? Congratulations, we are friends. Right? You won't wait. We're in the same second grade class. Best buddies for life. That's just how it's going to work. But when you get older, it actually takes effort. It takes intentionality. And so we have to ask ourselves, we evaluate our relationships, what are we putting on the table as well? And this is the last part I want to say about relationships, and this is this. Are we running the risk of putting expectations on people that are too unrealistic? If we're, if we're battling through the wilderness, are we, are we putting expectations on other people in our lives to be our everything? Are we expecting other people in our lives to be our source of joy? Are we expecting other people to be the reason that we are happy? Right? I think a lot of times we do that to other people. And what we've done is we've put an expectation on someone that they can never, ever meet. And when the light bulb goes off of that other person that they can't meet, it, what tends to happen is they tend to run away. Because they don't want that pressure. And so then we start the loneliness circle all over again. You know, maybe for a great line in a movie, when, you know, uh, Jerry Park, you complete me. Right? Great line for a movie. Totally wrong. Right? I, I, I get it. It works. It's all romantic and stuff. But it's bogus. It's straight up bogus. I, Jerry Park will be married. 24 years next year, she does not complete me. And I certainly don't complete her. Right? If I am not complete coming into the relationship, it is not fair to put it on her to make me that way. She can't do it. She's good. She's kind. She's loving. She does all these things that are wonderful, but she cannot make me complete, nor can I her. Those are unrealistic expectations. We talk about this in premarital counseling all the time, right? It's this idea that, that if, if, if who you are bringing into the picture is who you are. And you're not going to put it on the other person to make you something else. That's not fair to them, and both of you will be disappointed. Right? So we have to evaluate our relationships when we're thinking about, am I struggling with loneliness? Could it be that there's an issue in there somewhere that I can work on or that needs to change? Here's the second thing. Screen time. We have to evaluate our screen time. Now it sounds like we're talking to a overprayed classroom. Right? Screen time. But I'm telling you right now, this is a big deal. And this, I, I changed this last night, really late last night, with Jennifer's permission, because um, she completed this point. Oh, that was funny. I don't care. <laughs> uh, but she, we were talking about this, and it originally said social media. And then I just got to thinking it's bigger than that, right? It, it, it's, it's the screens. We, we have our faces as people in front of screens all the time, whether we're a big social media person or not. Right? And, and, and so we, we can find ourselves at times in front of the television 
and then the next thing we know, it's time to go to bed. And we've accomplished nothing, right? The only thing we've accomplished is we found the very bottom of the potato chip bag, right? And when we were, we're surrounded in crumbs, Netflix is asking us if we still want to keep watching, which is comedy, right? We're like, oh, shoot, thanks for rubbing that in my face, right? I'm still here. Yeah, all right, great. Now I feel guilty and, and shameful and, and all these other kinds of things, which only perpetuates. That, that's just it. Look at the loser that I am. No wonder there's nobody here. No wonder nobody likes me, et cetera, et cetera. So what do I do? I go, well, it's good to watch some more. And so we lock our eyes on screens all the time. All the time. Same thing on phones. So then even if it's not social media, right? The, the games, the, my gosh, the candy crush. And the, 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 there were people, I'm convinced it was worse than crack, the candy crush game for people in their lives that they, they couldn't stop. They could not stop. And then they made all kinds of other games that are just like it. You're popping bubbles and you're moving things and everything else. And it's on your phone. I'm telling you, church, if you got a smartphone, don't do it now. Because then you'll get distracted and start playing the game. But, but, but do it later when you get home. Uh, especially if you got an iPhone. I don't know about the Android stuff because uh, I'm safe. But um, <laughs> just kidding. Still love it. Still love it. But the iPhone, you can hit the button back in the settings and it'll tell you how much time you have been on their phone. Look at that. And then, and then come to Jesus, right? And, and I'll be in line with you, but just understand it, right? But, but we have to really look at our screen time, and especially social media. Social media, there's the research, just keeps showing us over and over and over again how social media, the longer we spend on it, the worse we begin to be. And it's not even a conscious thing. It's, it's not that we're looking necessarily at these terrible images or, or watching things that are inappropriate. It's not even just that. It's just the constant doom scrolling of just the next reel after the next reel after the next reel. And next thing we know, two hours have passed by and we feel like garbage. It's what happens. It's just in what happens. And so we have to evaluate, what, what am I giving my time to? Right? What does this really look like in my life? Am I potentially contributing myself to the way that I feel? Right? We, 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 we look to social media and, and technology to get us connected with other people, but research keeps showing that the opposite is actually what happens. Right? That we actually end up feeling less connected, uh, even though our phones are smart, right? We still feel lonely, we still feel isolated in spite of it all. And we, we try to get more friends on Facebook, we try to get more followers on, on Instagram. Did you, did you know like, that being an influencer is like a job? I mean, people are bringing in money. And, and their job title is a social media influence. Now, don't misunderstand me. If they want to cut me a check like that, I'll run the bank with a smile on my face. Right? I'm not going to lie to you. But at the same time, if I really stop and think about it, how miserable of an existence does that really have to be in life? Because everything I'm doing is chasing clicks. It's chasing likes. It's chasing to get more people to, to follow my page. So everybody else, people I've never met and never will, are dictating me. How lonely that must be. How isolated that must make somebody feel. Right? Snapchat, man. God bless Snapchat, but like the, the streets. The streets, we have taken an entire generation of young people and got them hooked on making sure they keep their streak up on, on Snapchat. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go find your grandkids, they'll tell you all about it. Right? But they gotta keep their streak up. They got they, they, they live for it. And I'm going, I get it, but but get off the phone. There's people in the other room. And we can have a 
conversation. When, and when words get put together in sentences, they become paragraphs. And that's a shriek, right? Like we can, we can do something different, right? But you can really be connected. I'm not, I'm not trying to poo poo at all. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not that guy. I'm just saying we have to be cautious of it and understand that many times how what we lock our eyes on is often uh, engaging in social media is too much screen time. Often it, it is the thing that causes us loneliness. Because here's the last thing to keep in mind about this: what do we do on social media? Our highlight reel. It's our highlight reel. People are posting pictures this morning all over the country about their church service. And, and, and they're snapping selfies with the pastor. And they're seeing their friends. And everybody's all smiling. And, and then there's some good clothes. And maybe, maybe the songs are really good. And somebody videoed that. They put that on social media. And they'll put some emojis with it. And it'll be great. Nobody recorded the video of the fight in the car on the way to church. Nobody recorded the husband and the wife arguing about where his shoes were. Right? Nobody does that. Why? Because, well, that doesn't make me look good. So I can edit that, right? I edit that on the fly. You don't know nothing about that. You watch somebody's social media feed, you think their life is perfect. Everything's great for them. Oh, man, I wish it was great for me, too. But I guess no. And there goes the loneliness. Again, it's a highlight. Don't forget that, right? Don't forget. Same thing with television. We watch shows and we disappear into them. It's not real. It's not real. It's not real. So don't forget that. Also, here, let's do this. We need to also evaluate our calendars. Evaluate our calendars if we're struggling with this idea of loneliness. John Ortberg, who is a, a pastor and an author, he said, hurry accelerates loneliness. Hurry accelerates and it's true. It's true, right? Because when we're super crazy busy, and when we're running from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing, we don't have time to build relationships. We don't have time for people, right? When we're just going 100 miles an hour all of the time. And so what we end up doing, we're trying to keep ourselves busy, keep ourselves distracted from being lonely and all the while actually making ourselves even lonelier. Because our calendar is so full of busyness that relationships aren't even there. We do this to our kids all the time. Our kids and our grandkids suffer through this all the time. If our kids need their own planner, uh, if our kids we need 17 calendars to figure out where they're supposed to be. Church, I'm just going to be straight up and say they're doing too much. They got quiet. I'm okay with that. It's too much. We exhaust our kids, keeping them in every activity and, and things known to mankind. And all the while, our kids, whether they voice it or not, are suffering internally from loneliness. Because it's just busyness, 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 go, go, go. Right? And, and, and then we put our kids in all these things, and we, we think they're getting connected to, to other people, but they're really not. Because all they're thinking about is where they got to go next. You know what our kids and our grandkids want? Us. Us. They may grunt, they may roll their eyes, they may stomp down the hallway, but what they really want is us. We put them in too busy in the calendar too full for them and for us to even be able to experience that, right? So we have to learn as people to slow down. Slow down. Some of you are going, the pastor, that's going to make me recognize my loneliness even more if I slow down. Well, research says it's actually the opposite. It's true. And so we have to be more people who slow down. Is there unscheduled time on your calendar? Like, do you have, this 
that a, it sounds like almost like oxymoron, doesn't it? Have you scheduled unscheduled time on your calendar? I, I confess, I am notorious that if there's an opening in my calendar and somebody needs the opening, I will fill the opening. And if I don't watch it, that calendar will be so incredibly full that I can't keep up with everywhere I'm supposed to be and who I'm supposed to talk to and everything else. The calendar said I had limited. But my heart and my mind and my knees said differently. Right? You just can't keep up with them all. We need to have unblocks of unscheduled time on our calendars so that we can do stuff that pops up. So that we can slow down and have a hallway conversation with that guy at work. So we can call up that person that we, that we miss seeing at church on Sunday and call them up on Tuesday and go, hey, I missed you. Hey, you want to go grab some coffee? We can be, be actually be able to do that because we have unscheduled time on our calendar. Here's the other question about your calendar. Do you have a little time on your calendar? Have you actually scheduled a little time? Sounds weird in the loneliness message, right? But here's the thing. The Lord is my shepherd. He's given me his Holy Spirit. I'm connected to him. But what's, how am I going to connect to him if I'm not stopping and giving him the time? Right? That just that alone time. And I, and I put that on my calendar as well. Right? So we really have to look at how busy and how we structure our day and our week and our months and our years, all of it. All of the times. And that the crazier our calendar looks, the more likely it's going to be that we are dealing with bouts of loneliness in our lives. And then here is the final. We have to evaluate our heart. We have to evaluate our heart. This is where it gets tricky. Because we have to be honest with ourselves. Right? We have to recognize what's really going on within us. Be truthful about the thoughts and the feelings that we're having deep inside. Right? I know a lot of people who are experiencing loneliness because their hearts are full of bitterness. And because their hearts full of bitterness, what ends up happening is, is their attitude, their behavior, their demeanor, all of that kind of stuff changes. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't like to be around bigger people too long. Can I get an amen on that? Right? We, we, we don't like to be around people like that. So what ends up happening is when we have that bitterness deep in our heart, we end up becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because we go, well, see, nobody, nobody wants to be around me. It's all their fault, right? And, and nobody cares about me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the while, it's bitterness in us that's affecting everything about us. So it's actually an us problem, not a them problem. When there's envy in my life, it's the same kind of a thing, right? Everybody else has all this stuff. Everybody else has a great life. I guess I'll just be stuck around here with a whole nasty couch. With nobody that cares. But we do this. We do this. I'm not trying to make fun of anybody. Please understand. But we do this as people. Right? And so when there's envy in our lives, man, we, we, we end up building walls from people that we can actually be connected with that would help us battle the things together. Okay? And so we have to deal with those kinds of things, right? Sin. Sin absolutely contributes to loneliness. Why? Because sin hinders my communication with God. And if I don't have a connection to God, if I feel disconnected from, from Him because of sin in my life, that snowball will pick up speed down the road. So I will feel alone. I will feel like God is far away. I will feel like he doesn't care anymore. In fact, I may even tell him that 
a time or two. But church, we have to, to pause and then really gut check ourselves and go, what's in my heart? What, what sin do I need to confess? What do I need the grace of Jesus to forgive me from? In order that I can hear once again. In order that I can sense his presence once again in my life. Sin completely will render us lonely every single time. So, so how are we doing at devoting ourselves to the Word of God? Because the Word of God is what changes our hearts. How are we doing in our times of prayer? Are we slowing down and, and making a long time for that to happen, like with our calendar? But, but are we also open to what the Lord has to say? to us? Are, are we just telling God all the things we want and, and the things we hit our suggestions to Him, you know, that He should do? Or are we really pausing and going, search my heart, O oh God? Are we asking Him to say, Lord, if there's any wicked way within me, Lord, I want you to reveal it because I want to confess it and I want it gone from my life. Are we asking the Lord, Lord, take my cup and cleanse it from all unrighteousness and fill me fresh and new with your spirit in order that I might be whole as you are. Right? So we have to evaluate our hearts as well. Sometimes Brahms, we just can say we want God's blessings more than we want him. Right? We love the stuff God can give us. I mean, He gives us stuff all the time. Uh, like oxygen. That's my favorite, by the way. Right? He gives us the stuff, and just like it's all around us. I know I've gotten that rain a little weird, right? But 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 God blessed us with that. Wow. Parking lot out here has vehicles in it. Some are new and some are old, but they all got here today. Praise the Lord. Right? We, we all have a roof over our head that I'm assuming doesn't leak. And if it does leak, we, we, we know of God. We'll get you connected if your roof leaks. Right? But that's a blessing from God. We're in here together with each other. Church, we get to come worship today. Church, these are blessings from God. We, we love all of that, but how much do we long for it? Like, like for real, if, if, if we came to gather together at 10 30 on a Sunday morning, and then all the stuff on a Sunday morning happened, right? There's prayer, there's singing, and, and, and somebody sharing the message. If all of those things took place, but Jesus wasn't here, would we still want to come? See, this is all about him. Every bit of it. I'm thankful for our praise team, but I gotta confess, I don't come to hear them. I come to see Jesus. And I trust that this praise team is gonna help me a part, a tool, a vessel that Jesus uses to reveal himself to this body. That's what we come to. Because we long for him more than we long for anything else. If he gave us nothing ever again, he is still worthy. Amen? So we have to evaluate our hearts. Where are we in our lives in that regard? So church, is the Lord your shepherd? Like true leadership. You're in a relationship with Him that is so close that you can say, I don't lack anything because He's with me. And I don't mean an intellectual knowledge of all of that. I mean that you can go through your day, that you can go through your circumstances, that you can go to work, that you can go to the grocery store. 
and you can go to the dysfunctional family function. You can go anywhere you want to go knowing that the Lord your God is with you and it makes all the difference in the world. Because you don't even want to be there. You're surrounded by all these other people. When you do have to be in the house by yourself, do you make it through? Because you might be alone, but not lonely. Because the Lord is your shepherd. Can you boldly make that claim today? If not, I'm going to introduce you to Jesus. Because that's what he has in store for you. I am with you. I'm giving you my Holy Spirit to be with you. So that you don't have to be. You can invite the camera to make this way up. Because we're going to participate in communion together today. Communion is so much more. For, forgive me if I'm too blunt today, but I think sometimes we, we, we treat communion almost like a mid church snack. It's just kind of a thing that we do. When we take communion today, what we need to understand is that we are celebrating and saying in our participation that I know I'm not lonely because I've got Jesus. I know that, that my cup has been emptied and cleaned by his blood. And I may not always get it right. The circumstances might knock me down. But I keep coming back to the reminder that the Lord is my shepherd and I like that. We participate in communion together. We're with Jesus. We are with Jesus and we are with each other as the body of Christ when we do so. So church, as we close and get into communion today, I want to ask you this question. Your cup of loneliness needs to be poured out today. If you're in this room and in your own live stream today, if you need Jesus to take your cup, which is you, and just you're full of loneliness, it's, it's what you've known. Maybe it's a word you've been in for a long time. Do you need Jesus to pour that out in order that he might fill it once again with himself? Do you need that today? If so, I want to invite you. I want you to confess that. I want you to ask that of him today because he is faithful and will do it. Amen? Then here's my last question. Are you in communion with Jesus? That's why we participate in communion. It's not a church ritual. It's, it, it is because we're saying Jesus is my shepherd. I'm in communion with him. He is the Lord of my life and therefore I celebrate
things in our life distract us from healthy relationships with others who can help us become all that you intended us to be.
Church, I'm going to invite you to stand to your feet. Thank you for being here today. If you're with us online, thank you as well. And uh, we are going to dismiss now and make our way if you're in person here, make our way over to the fellowship hall space uh, for our taco lunch time uh, together. Uh, there is the, we're going to try to prove that with Jesus and tacos, you can never be lonely. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Amen. And as a church, you are loved and dismissed. God bless.